Okay, well, I make it just past three o'clock, so we'll make a start and people can join us uh, as they can. So, um, good afternoon and welcome to Epilepsy Research UK's More Than Seizures webinar as part of National Epilepsy Week. I'm really delighted to join you. I'm Dr. James Pickett, the Director of Research and Innovation at Epilepsy Research UK and your host for today. So just a bit of housekeeping uh, before we get going with our uh, brilliant talks today. Um, if there's a fire alarm, there isn't expected to be a fire alarm today and uh, the toilet should be upstairs somewhere in your house. But uh, no, I, I joke. But um, if you're joining us on Zoom, then, um, then welcome. There's a couple of ways that you can interact with us today. You'll find down the bottom, you'll find a question and answer box. We'd really like if you could use that. Uh, if you have any questions for any of our speakers coming up, then please just type them in there. And my colleagues, James, Quiver and Joe, are hovering in the background with their virtual microphones and we'll be able to put them to our speakers at the end of the talk. And there's also a chat box uh, for you to be able to talk to uh, everyone who's uh, watching this webinar and, and share your thoughts if, if you don't want to ask a specific question, but you've just got a reflection you want to share. And similarly, those joining us on Facebook, hello, and uh, please use the, the comments function in that way as well. And we'll work to assimilate as many comments uh, as we possibly can. So I just want to move my slides on. So yeah, so we have a, a, a brilliant lineup of speakers today that you'll hear from over the next hour and um, lots of ways up the top there that if you're not interacting already with Epilepsy Research UK then please find us on Facebook or on Twitter or uh, click on our, go to our website and uh, join us there and sign up for our news. So we all know why we're here. It's uh, National Epilepsy Week, uh, the week when all uh, the different charitable organisations really come together uh, to raise awareness of the, both the scale and impact of epilepsy. And as someone who is fairly new to the epilepsy field myself, I'm still uh, learning, but still kind of really staggered by some of these numbers. Uh, that it's really, I think, the third most common neurological condition and over 600,000 people in the UK uh, are living with a diagnosis of epilepsy, something I wasn't aware of just uh, three months ago. I've kind of in my first few weeks of being here, um, realised that we've actually, compared to other brain diseases, epilepsy has been quite successful in finding treatments. And that's really hopeful and positive for the future and, and gives me confidence that research may lead us to more treatments. But yet still, in particular, there's a real unmet need here. And 30% of people living with uncontrolled seizures is something that we want to change in the future. So Epilepsy Research UK is uniquely positioned in the UK. Uh, to really try to change people's lives with epilepsy through research. And we think that driving and enabling research is the only way to achieve this. And so it's been a really busy week for us already at Epilepsy Research UK as part of the National Epilepsy Week. And I just want to highlight on Monday, we announced uh, 1.3 million pounds of new funding for epilepsy research, which is the most that the charity's ever been able to do, uh, to offer in grants to researchers. And we're really grateful to all our supporters for making that possible. And on the right there, you'll see the 10 new grants that we've been able to award in couple of, a couple of faces that you've already seen uh, from Mike and from Sophie, who are gonna talk a bit more detail about their projects in a minute. So as I said, the theme of National Epilepsy this week is about more than seizures. And now being again new to the field, I, I don't have a personal understanding yet of what that particularly means, but I'm beginning to learn about the multitude of different ways that um, epilepsy can affect someone's life. And we're gonna hear in a, in, a, in, in a few minutes from both Mike and Sophie about the kind of their scientific perspectives on that and how research is forging our understanding to help more than seizures. But first, I'm going to introduce Faye, who's one of our uh, supporters and epilepsy advocate and blogger, to talk about her personal experience of what more than seizures means to her as someone actually living with epilepsy. So at that point, I'm going to um, say, I hope you enjoy the, in, hope you enjoy the next hour. Please uh, engage with us and let us know your comments and thoughts as we go. And uh, I'll hand over to Faye. Thank you. Hello there, can everybody hear me? 
as James just said, I'm Faye. I have lived with epilepsy now for 27 years. Puts me in the position that I have been a child with epilepsy. I've been a teenager with epilepsy. I've been at university. I've been an adult. And now, probably my most important role, I'm a mum with epilepsy. I have to say, I was really excited when I heard the theme for this year. And even more so when I was asked to speak by epilepsy research. Um, more than seizures is something that I've been advocating for a long, long time. So many people have the misconception that it's just about medication, that you take a pill, you don't have seizures and life goes on. That isn't the case for many. And even when you have seizure control, so often that isn't the end of it. I tend to refer to my own epilepsy journey as being a bit like an iceberg. And for me, seizures are the tip of that iceberg. They are what people see. It's the bit above the water. But for me, it is more than the seizures. And that's everything that goes on underneath the surface. And that's affected all parts of my life. It isn't just now I'm an adult. If I think back to being seven and being diagnosed, all of a sudden I was singled out from my peers and my classmates. You can't do this. You mustn't do that. And it was... It was isolating, it was frightening, it was frustrating um, and that's part of the reason I'm over the moon to be involved with Sophie's project that she's going to talk to you in a bit about because mental health is one of the other things that is so prominent in those with epilepsy. There are so many other elements to it and actually anxiety is a really common one so making sure that people get the support for that is really important. Um, as I said, I was a teenager, pushing the boundaries. Many of us will be honest and say we went through a stage of not wanting to take our medication. We, I was then at university. Um, that was quite difficult, learning to adapt to a life with epilepsy as well as going out, being sociable. And for the first time in my life, I didn't have my mum there reminding me to take my medication. Um, then as a young adult, when I finished university, I wanted to go travelling. I couldn't just pack my bags and book a ticket to Australia. Uh, I had to have quite long conversations with my epilepsy nurse about the practicalities of all of that. It's not as simple as just getting on with it. And then obviously I've become a mum and that comes with its own challenges and probably has been the biggest challenges I've faced. Not only that, epilepsy isn't just about the seizures. I... It's not one medication that will help you and what works for someone won't work for others. My battles with Kepra are well documented. It gave me seizure control, however, didn't allow me. I couldn't live with the side effects. And had you said to me 10 years prior to that, would you get, ever give up a medication that stops your seizures? I said, no, no way, not in a million years. But it made me angry, it made me anxious and it turned me into somebody that wasn't very nice and that that's what people don't see the choice between seizure control and sometimes the not very nice side effects and that leads me on to obviously becoming a mum I was very fortunate that my epilepsy nurse had taken me off sodium valproate when I met my now husband anticipating at some point I would want to start a family so when I fell pregnant with my son I had been seizure free for over 18 months I'd had conversations with my team I had no reason to believe that my pregnancy wouldn't be anything other than smooth um, that's not how it went I unfortunately suffered several tonic clonic seizures as well as complex partial seizures on an almost daily basis and they resulted in me falling downstairs whilst heavily pregnant and I had to make the choice that did I increase the medication which we know can come with risks or do I just try and ride this out and know that potentially I wouldn't make it to the end of my pregnancy and they're, they're not conversations you know when you think about growing up and you're happily ever after it's not a conversation you envision ever having with your partner and then I'm grateful to say Noah came along safely and he will be five next month, but it affects his life too. Um, 
from the second he was old enough, he's been taught about epilepsy and he talks about mummy having seizures like most kids would refer to their mums having a cold. Um, he knew our address from the second he could talk. He knew how to use the phone to at least phone somebody to make them aware. Also, I taught him road safety from the second he could start toddling about because I was so petrified that I'd lose consciousness and he wouldn't be safe and they're not things that again you ever dream about having to teach your child but it affects every part of my life someone always has to know the route I'm taking where I am you know we laugh but if people try and call me and I don't answer my sister particularly will panic straight away it really affects the whole family um and it's difficult but it's manageable and for me it's why this has really been so important and I think going forward we need to really focus on the fact that epilepsy is so much more than seizures and focus on that and make it I don't want people to feel isolated so I'm really looking forward to raising some more awareness around what it's like to live with epilepsy on a day-to-day -day basis and how people manage to live with the more than seizures. Thank you very much. Any questions, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Faye. Um, that, was, that was brilliant and really explained. I, I, the iceberg analogy I've um, just reflecting on and lots more to think on on that. Um, I think we have um, some questions. I'm going to ask my colleague um, Quiva to uh, to just uh, pick up where the, where the conversations are. Great. Sorry, just unmuting myself. Thanks so much, Faye. We've had a lot of people really liking your iceberg <laughs> analogy there, that seizures are the tip of the iceberg. I think that's a brilliant way to put it and fits so well with the theme. Um, so the first question we have for you is, what role do you think people with epilepsy should play in influencing what organisations like ourselves at Epilepsy Research UK fund? I think it really needs to be a joint effort. Um, I don't believe anybody knows best. We're always learning where epilepsy is concerned. I think we need a good 50-50 balance. The scientists are there for a reason. The doctors are there for a reason. They're the experts in their fields. But equally, you have to listen to Joe Bloggs on the street and know what's affecting the likes of me and our life on a day-to-day -day basis and actually what we need to live our lives in the most constructive ways possible. So I think it needs to be a real team effort. Thank you, Faye. Um, and as, as someone living with epilepsy, what would you hope to see in the future to come from epilepsy research? That's a good one. Ideal world, I'd love for a cure. I'd love nothing more than to have no seizures, to not have to take the medication. In the event that's not a possibility, my next hope would be for a medication that came without side effects and full seizure control. Excellent. And Faye, another question for you. Are you aware of any support groups for children or sibling carers for people living with epilepsy? Not directly for siblings. I do know of a few groups, but I wouldn't say there are any. There's a really good one. I can't remember the name of it, but I'm quite happy to find it and post it up for you. Mm -hmm. It does look at supporting sort of family members, not just siblings, more family members. Yeah, yeah, someone's just um, just written in to say that SIBS is an excellent charity. So there they work with with siblings as well. And okay. you, you mentioned previously that you've worked um, with Sophie, who we'll be yeah. hearing from later. Um, but I know you've also been a, a representative on the Valproy Stakeholders Network yeah. as well. Would you like to speak about that for a moment? Yeah, the Valpray Stakeholders Network is really, really important. Um, as I said, my nurse took me off Valpray many years ago. She was ahead of her times. Unfortunately, that message hasn't got out quite as clearly that now you should not be on Valpray 
and trying for a baby. There's the pregnancy prevention register now that if any woman is being put on, she should be being warned of the risks of Valparate. She should be talked through it all. She should be made aware of her options. There should be yearly reviews. Um, I do urge any woman of childbearing age, if you are on Valparate and you've not had these conversations, please, please, I know in the middle of a pandemic, it's not the best time, but please do get in contact with your teams and have that discussion because it's, I've always been a massive advocate for know, know your options, know your choices and know what the risks are. It is an individual choice, but you really need to be having that conversation. Thank you, Faye. Um, and we've also had, I think we've got time for just one more question. Um, Anita in the comments has just asked, were there any specific triggers for your, um, your seizures and did you ever feel that they were, they were unavoidable? Um, yes, tiredness is a really big one for me. Um, quite often means I can be a bit of a party pooper. I need to go to bed. <laughs> and that, that's difficult to live with because sometimes you know that not as your own doing. I never want to say that, but obviously if you know that puts you at risk, you have to be more aware of that and deal with it. Obviously, um, too much alcohol can be a big one and stress is a really big one for me as well. Um, it can be really difficult to manage that. I do all I can, but can't always be helped. Of course, thank you so much for answering the questions. There are a lot of people just saying thank you so much um, for, for sharing your story. Um, so thank you so much, Faye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Faye, on behalf of Epilepsy Research for everything you do. Um, thank you for having me. And I'm now going to move us on to our, our next speaker, who's Mike Cousin from uh, the University of Edinburgh. And he's going to tell us about his work and the perspectives it gives us on, on more than seizures, because ultimately we, we think that research uh, through, as Faye is hopeful, through finding the ways that the disease progresses uh, will lead us to new treatments and preventions and even maybe ideally one day cures that means that people can live uh, lives that are much more than seizures. So thank you, I'll hand over to Mike. Okay, thank you very much, James, for that. Um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to come, come and speak with you all today. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do today, if I can get this video started. Um, what I'm gonna try and do today is give you a little bit of background on the process of brain communication, just as a bit of a primer. I'm going to tell you about some of the potential causes that we know uh, of epilepsy, and then some, some potential therapeutic roadmaps that, that might be put in place for the next few years. So I guess a key question uh, for, for today and, and for, for most days is, well, what causes epilepsy? What causes seizure activity? And that's a pretty tough question to address because when you think about the human brain and you think even if you zoom into this little red square at the very top, there's just a ton of stuff going on. There's roughly about 100 billion neurons in a, in a, in a typical human brain and they're all intricately interconnected. And that makes that very difficult to tease apart in somebody with epilepsy exactly what's potentially going wrong. So what our lab does and what a number of groups around the world do is to try and simplify that question a lot by looking at the basic signaling component of the brain, which is a brain cell or otherwise known as a neuron. Now neurons transmit information usually unidirectionally from in this cartoon left to right as I'm moving my arrow, my arrow across the screen and they receive information at these things called dendrites that information is transmitted in the form of an electrical impulse along the thing called an axon, and then the information is disseminated or given out by these nerve terminals. Okay, so that's a basic signaling unit. Now, of course, they've got to be able to talk to each other. So they talk to each other at, pro at a structure called a synapse, seen here in this diagram. And so here's our nerve terminal, and here's our dendrite. And a typical neuron has an average between 1,000 and 10,000 synapses. Now, if you scale that to the 100 billion neurons that are present in the human brain, that means we've got approximately about 10 to the power 14 synapses. 
Now, these are 10 to the power of 14 communication points that are, that are basically going on as we speak right now. And it's incredible when you think about it that the human brain works so well that there's not more problems than there actually are. One, one key problem, though, with a synapse is that this electrical signal that comes down this long thin axon has to encounter a gap between the nerve terminal and the dendrite. So how does the neuron cure this problem? Well, the problem's cured by something called synaptic signaling. So just to illustrate this, I've just got two identical neurons, and I'm going to show you how information is transferred from one to the other across this synapse. So the first thing that happens is in neuron one here, an electrical impulse comes down this axon and reaches this nerve terminal. This nerve terminal then receives this electrical impulse and releases chemical neurotransmitters, seen here in red. These chemical neurotransmitters then diffuse across this gap, the synaptic gap, and stick to the dendrites in the neighboring neuron. This process of the chemical neurotransmitter sticking to the dendrites propagates a new electrical impulse and then information is transferred. So therefore, the information goes electrical, chemical, electrical. And this is the basis of almost all brain communication between neurons. It's very simple and it's very efficient and it allows for very fast transfer of information. So how does this chemical signal get released? Well, it gets released through this process of synaptic vesicle fusion. And I'll take you through this. So here's the long thin axon. This is just a higher resolution image of the one I showed you, I showed you previously. The electrical impulse comes, comes down this axon, invades this nerve terminal, and it causes the merging of these football-like structures called synaptic vesicles. Now these football-like structures are crammed full of the chemical neurotransmitter. And when electrical activity occurs, it causes these vesicles to merge with the outside of the cell to release that neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter can then diffuse across the synapse and bind to the dendrite to propagate the action potential. So synaptic vesicles are kind of the currency for which neurotransmitter release is, is predicated. So this little diagram highlights what happens at the nerve terminal. So you've got some vesicles here that are full of neurotransmitter. And an interesting thing to note is that in a typical nerve terminal in the brain, you only have about 200 or 300 vesicles per nerve terminal. And that's not a lot, considering that neurons can fire up to one, uh, 1,000 hertz. That's 1,000 times a second. So therefore, this is, there's a real, very real danger that these vesicles could run out during neuronal communication. So the way that the nerve terminal sustains this supply of vesicles is to remake them locally through a series of different endocytosis pathways shown here. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that, but the key thing to note is that as long as you have an efficient recycling of these vesicles after they've released their chemical neurotransmitter, you can usually sustain neurotransmission. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the primer on synaptic communication. And of course, the key question is, well, what potentially could go wrong with this process that, that could culminate in epilepsy? Well, to address this question, a, a, a number of good groups have tackled this by looking in people with epilepsy and looking to see if they have mutations in genes that, that are part of this recycling pathway. The reason that people did that is they thought, well, maybe there's just one aspect of this pathway that's been messed up by this mutation. And therefore, if we can identify which, which part of the pathway is, is messed up, we can try and target it, design drugs against it, and potentially combat seizures in these so that's what was done. It's been going on, it still is ongoing. It's been going for really the last 10 years properly. And this diagram shows you the genes that are linked to synaptic vesicle recycling that have been identified in people with a number of different forms of epilepsy. And the first thing that you'll, that'll strike you as, as, as being obvious is that these genes are highly com comorbid or they also occur in people that have autism and also intellectual disabilities. So there's a huge amount of overlap in these genes between a number of different neurodevelopmental disorders. However, if we could just concentrate on the epilepsy genes for the moment, what do we know about the function of these genes that have been identified in people, and what do they do in the vesical life cycle, and do they control a particular aspect of that vesical cycle which we can target? Well, this comes to kind of the first 
disappointing but also encouraging aspect of this research. So if you map out where all these genes have, do their jobs in this a more detailed version of the vesicle life cycle, what you can see with the red rings around them is that basically they do a job, every single gene has a job somewhere in this pathway, but nowhere specific to this pathway. Okay, so there's not as if everything converges around chemical transmitter release, or everything converges around endocytosis. Now, in one aspect, that's disappointing because we would have hoped that we had one process which we could target and then really focus down on to look for new therapies. But on the other hand, it's encouraging because it suggests that if you are able to target anywhere within this whole vesicle recycling pathway, then you might actually be able to combat a far wider range of epilepsies than you would do by just one specific genetic epilepsy. So how could a dysfunction in this vesicle life cycle end up culminating in seizure activity and epilepsy? Well, there's a number of ways that could do this. And we have to think at a higher level here about the connections between neurons rather than the neurons themselves. So one way that we know that epilepsy can occur is if circuit activity goes wrong. So here we have six brain cells or neurons all interconnected in a very simple circuit. There's the dendrite and there's a nerve terminal. And you can see this connects to this, this connects to this and so on. In a lot of developmental disorders early in life, the wiring goes wrong for some reason. And of course, this creates new circuits, which, which can obviously precipitate epilepsy. But in addition to this, if you have a defect or dysfunction in the release of chemical neurotransmitter, the brain tries to correct it because the brain's highly plastic. So when I say by, what I mean by plastic is it's continually changing its connections to try and optimize indication. But sometimes it gets it wrong. Not surprising when you have 10 to the power 14 uh, connections. So therefore, you can sometimes get miswiring and that potentially can lead to epilepsy. The second way that circuits can, uh, a circuit dysfunction can arise is the fact that not all neurons speak the same language. And when I say space speak the same language, what I mean is that they have different patterns of communication. So that although they all use electrical impulses, some use far higher frequency impulses to encode a different higher level of information. So in this circuit, what you can see is this neuron and this neuron are firing at higher frequencies than the other four. And we know from our work and certainly the work of plenty of others, that these deficits in neurotransmitter release tend to be exacerbated in neurons that fire at high intensity. So therefore, again, these two neurons might not, might not function quite as well if you have a deficit in neurotransmitter release, again, leading to circuit dysfunction. Now, the final way circuit activity could be disrupted is by the fact that not all brain cells are created equal. Some brain cells like to excite others. And that's basically the example I've given so far. For example, here, this green cell connects with this other green cell and activates it. It makes it um, fire um, electrical activity. However, these blue cells, when they're activated, they do the opposite. They try and dampen down the ability of this neuron to fire. So these neurons, the green ones, are called excitatory neurons. And these blue neurons are called inhibitory neurons. And if you have a particular deficit in vesicle uh, recycling or transmitter release that happen in these inhibitory neurons, you end up getting a, a situation like this, where you have a, a hyperexcitability of the circuit. And again, that could potentially lead to epilepsy. So what I've shown you so far is that certain genetic studies have identified the neurotransmitter release as a, as, a, as a potential or defective neurotransmitter release as the cause of epilepsy. This is manifested at the cell level. It can translate into altered circuit activity and, of course, uh, leads to epilepsy. However, that obviously doesn't explain all forms of epilepsy because we know that obviously some forms of epilepsy occur at the level of whole brain. For example, like acute brain injury, if you have an infection, brain tumor, and so on. Even at things like Alzheimer's, which James mentioned earlier, that people, with it, people can actually have epilepsy as a consequence of getting Alzheimer's because you get a, a selective destruction of particular brains, altering circuit, uh, brain cells, altering circuit activity. So we know that the causes of epilepsy can range all the way through genetics, right the way through to acute injury of, of a whole brain. Now, putting all that together, what can that tell us potentially about ways we could think about new therapies? Well, there's a number of ways you can think about this. You can think of it in a very people-centric way. 
using a, approaches that I kind of just told you about, where at the start, you look at people's genetics that have epilepsy and identify mutations in their genes. Then you work out what, what processes those, those genes um, uh, coordinate and then try and design therapies. You can go a level up to cells, brain cells. But this time, rather than taking brain cells from people, you actually take skin cells, change them into neurons in a dish, and look to see how the properties of those, those cells differ from cells from people who don't have epilepsy, to identify which processes might be good to target. You can obviously, at the whole, level, whole uh, body level, look at EEG activity and lots of other brain imaging activities too, to try and work out where the circuit dysfunction might be in people with epilepsy. And of course, you can study people with epilepsy too and, and ask them how, how their lives impacted. But that's a very people-centric way, and it's very bottom-up. It goes all the way through genes, through cells, through circuits to people. Just a valid approach, though, is to go from the top down. For example, if you have very good models of epilepsy, you can infer a lot about function. So there are a number of excellent epilepsy models being generated now. For example, of focal epilepsy, where a specific lesion is put in, into, the, into the brain and that causes epilepsy. Or you can generate um, animals that carry a particular mutation that's been identified in a human disease, and you can observe the epilepsy in these models. And then, of course, you can go from top down. You can look to see how circuit activity in these models is altered by doing advanced electrophysiology, where you monitor thousands of neurons uh, at the same time as a cohort. You can also take cells from these models, grow them in a dish, and see how they behave in comparison to cells that have been taken from animals that don't have epilepsy. In a very similar way, you can do with patient cells. And even at the level of genetics, you can still extract information because remember, as I said, the human brain is highly plastic. So therefore, you can look to see what alterations, even at the genetic level, the brain is trying to make to try and combat this initial insult that's happened at the brain level. And this could be encouraging because again, you're looking at genes that are getting turned on to try and combat epilepsy. So therefore, maybe these are genes we want to try and encourage to express in the processes they control are things that we're trying to boost. So therefore, you can look at the level of genes to people, and that's obviously a very viable therapeutic route. And similarly, you can look at models uh, all the way down to genes again, and that's equally valid. And I think what will happen in the next five to 10 years is there's going to be a huge amount of cross-fertilization between all of these different pathways, where we identify more genes that are linked to causes, or processes that are linked to causes, and critically, how will this translate to altered neuronal activity at the level of circuits? Okay, I'll just wind up by just saying, obviously, the reason that this is so important, and James touched on this as an introduction, is that although I've, I've talked about causes today, um, the, the sad fact is that actually about two thirds of people, we used to really have no idea what the cause of their epilepsy is. It's still idiopathic. And as mentioned again earlier, that about a third of people that have epilepsy still have seizures that are unresponsive to current drugs. So therefore, it's a real urgent unmet need to determine more causes of epilepsy, which will hopefully lead to better treatment. And of course, by finding new treatments, we can then look back at the, at the epilepsies that still remain and try and determine their cause in this sort of virtuous cycle. So I'll finish up there. I just want to thank, obviously, Epilepsy Research UK, and especially all of you, uh, all the people who run marathons, all the people that donate and devote your time to raising money for our charity. Uh, as, as James said, uh, there's been a record amount being invested this year in uh, epilepsy research across a whole range of different projects, totaling 1.3 million. And as a, as a current grant recipient and obviously chair of the SAC, the Scientific Advisory Committee, I'm hugely grateful to all of you for all your support. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Mike. That was uh, tremendous. And um, I, I share the real hope coming into the field of kind of how much progress we are making and kind of being on the tip of, to use the iceberg analogy, kind of the tip of the iceberg of really getting to, to what's underneath epilepsy and the causes. So, um, Quiva, are, are you there with, with some questions for Mike? Yes, we've been getting lots of questions. Um, my mind is always blown by that 100 million neurons stat. That's a, a huge number. Um, and yes, we've had some, some great questions in. Thank you to everyone for sending them in to us. Um, so first question, um, you've spoken about learning more about drug resistant um, epi 
epileptic encephalopathies and being able to find treatments. Um, and someone's written in to say that that would have a huge impact on people with drug resistant epilepsy. Could this also help towards treatments for other types of epilepsy as well? Yeah, I would, I would certainly, I, that's, that's the hope, let's say at least anyway. I mean, certainly we, we use model systems. So one of the easier, way, is, easier models to use is to have a defined cause and then for you can try and, try and basically correct that, that epilepsy with that cause. Now the types of processes that we're looking at in terms of just control of, of brain communication and neurotransmitter release, we, we would hope that although we're looking at particular genetic epilepsies at the minute, the processes that are dysfunctional in these genetic epilepsies are fairly widespread in, in a number of other forms of epilepsy. And the types of interventions that we're trying to make to try and boost the ability of the brain to release neurochemi or neurochemicals properly should be quite translatable across a number of different epilepsies. So certainly that, that is our hope, that although we're working in a quite narrow field of and rare epilepsies, that they will be able to be expanded out in, in the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. Um, and we've had another, another question um, saying, as a mother of a child with learning disabilities, I am so incredibly grateful for epilepsy research funding this sort of work. Mike, have you always been interested in learning in the link between epilepsy and learning disability? And, and how did you first get interested in that? That's an, that's an excellent question, actually. So we, um, so our lab's been going for about 20 years now, and we've always had this interest in, in neurotransmitter release. And even when we started, we always, had, we always had this feeling that there was a big miss, missed opportunity not to be looking at this process of neurotransmitter release. I mean, I think a lot of people at the start thought well, it was such an essential process that, you know, it, how can you even try and monitor or regulate something like this? And I think the thing that really got us into it is actually a drug that a couple of people have mentioned already, and it's Kepra. Uh, because the, find, the finding that Kepra bound to a particular protein found on synaptic vesicles called SP2A back in... 2004, um, kind of suggested to us, well, maybe there is scope to try and look at this, this process of vesicle recycling in more detail. And that sort of led us to, to look at a number of different genes and a number of different processes within the, within the presynapse. And actually, we're, we're, we, as I say, we're working with a number of now models of autism and intellectual disability that are linked to, to epilepsy too. So I think, I think it was probably the advent of, or the discovery that Kepra had a mechanism of action that happened through synaptic musical recycling is the main driver. Brilliant. And to follow on nicely with that, um, Jill in Glasgow has submitted a question about autism and epilepsy. And so how closely linked are they? In terms of genetics, closer than, quite close. I mean, certainly that Venn diagram that I had up, you can see actually the number of genetic, the amount of genetic overlap at the level of neurotransmitter at least at least anyway because that Venn diagram was only genes that have a function in the synaptic vesicle life cycle. Now autism, there's a lot of number of autism genes that are, that are out with that for example, but certainly the, 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 the commonality within autism, epilepsy and a lump in uh, intellectual disability as well with that is quite striking actually and you know we've, we've got a lot of unpublished work at the minute with, with various uh, autism models that show similarities in cell behavior, at least anyway, between epilepsy models and autism models. Too. So I think there's potential that there's dis that there's potential to correct dysfunction across a range of different developmental disorders. Thanks, Mike. Um, and we've had a question from Claire in London. Uh, she's asked, how do you qualify to be on the scientific advisory committee? You can send her your CV afterwards, I'm sure. <laughs> I think maybe the SEC say that as well. <laughs> so, so basically, we've, as I say, we've worked on epilepsy now for, I guess, uh, just, just shy of 15 years. And it was all kick-started by a grant, actually, from Epilepsy Research UK back in 2004-2005. So we've, we've built up a, a lot of knowledge in, in the field. Uh, and I think the, the thing that really merits inclusion on the Scientific Advisory Committee is having knowledge in a, in a particular discipline. So the great thing about the SAC is we have a, a number of different clinicians, a number of different scientists that work all the way from, from genes to cells to circuits, all the way through to, to, to studies that you're going to hear about in a second, the studies of people as well. And I think that's its real strength. I mean, I would not profess to, to know much about uh, circuit activity or, or human studies, 
But I think that the, 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 I think my qualification was that we, we do know a lot about synaptic signaling, and that's really why why we, we, we came forward for that. And of course, we have um, our experts by experience as well on the scientific advisory committee mm, yes, um, who bring their own experience of epilepsy. Um, so yeah, they, I think I think Tori was in the audience earlier. So hi, Tori, um, and thank you. Um, so another question. In. We'll move. Oh. Are you Quiva? Sorry, I'm just I'm just aware of the time, so I reckon we should. Uh, move on and then come back if we have any questions at the end but um, I'm keen to introduce our, our third speaker of the day to give us a another perspective on a life more than seizures so um, really delighted to introduce Sophie Bennett who is also a grant recipient from ER UK and um, also a clinical lecturer at Great Ormond Street so thanks so much I hope I've got that right thanks so much for um, joining us Sophie and really looking forward to your presentation. I'm really excited to be able to present this uh, work to everybody that's listening. So I'm just trying to move this. move on there. So the reason that we're talking about mental health today is, as has already been um, talked about, we know that mental health problems in children and young people and in adults with epilepsy are much more common than in children um, and young people who don't have a physical health condition. So actually up to seven times greater um, than standard community samples. We don't know exactly why this is, um, but there are lots of reasons that that might be the case. Um, so one is that we know that children with epilepsy um, may also have um, physical disabilities and those themselves might be um, associated with higher rates of mental health problems. Uh, they're also more likely to have um, differences in learning and difficulties in learning and those are themselves more likely to be associated with uh, mental health problems. And we know that because there are much higher rates of uh, mental health problems in children with neurological conditions compared to children who have other physical health conditions, um, that there are likely to be some direct brain behavior links. And so uh, the way the brain is wired maybe puts them at risk for having both mental health problems and epilepsy. So I think Faye has already spoken um, a bit about this, but thinking about why we care about that um, and, and mental health particularly, given that um, we know that children with epilepsy and their families have much more to contend with, including um, medication reg regimes and hospital visits. Um, well, this is a study, a, a graph from a study um, by a different research group, um, but this is, uh, shows quality of life along this axis and then different domains of quality of life across this axis. So higher scores here indicate better quality of life. So if you take a group of children with epilepsy and you split them by whether they have seizures or whether they don't have seizures, actually their quality of life is much the same across all of those different domains. But if you take that same group of children and you split them by whether they have a mental health disorder or a neuro neurodevelopmental disorder like autism, and they, or whether they don't have uh, a mental health disorder, what you can see is the children who have a mental health disorder um, have lower quality of life than children uh, with, without a mental health disorder. So actually what that suggests is that mental health problems impact more on quality of life than things like seizure frequency. So it's really important. It's so important that NICE guidance in the UK uh, suggests that the psychological needs of young people with epilepsy should always be considered. But what we know from families that we work with and also from clinicians is that actually often those mental health problems aren't detected and they're often not treated. There are lots of reasons why that might be. So one is that within an epilepsy appointment, um, understandably uh, the epilepsy and the seizures are, are considered first and foremost. Um, so the mental health problems may get overshadowed by that. Also, uh, 
in the UK, but also uh, in, in many places globally, we know that um, mental health services and uh, physical health services, so the paediatric hospitals, are separated. So there's a separation of expertise um, with uh, people in epilepsy services not necessarily knowing all about the mental health side and similarly people in mental health services not understanding epilepsy. And because of that lack of understanding, some people might suggest that uh, children with epilepsy and mental health problems have those mental health problems because of the epilepsy and therefore there's nothing that we can do to treat them. And in our research group, we don't think that that is true. So what does the evidence base show for uh, what does work to treat mental health problems in children? Well, we know from children without epilepsy that there are some really good treatments. So, uh, cognitive behaviour therapy for anxiety and the mood um, and parenting uh, interventions for behavioural difficulties um, and there are literally thousands of papers that demonstrate that those treatments work for children who don't have epilepsy. However, there are not very many studies that show whether those same treatments work in children who do have epilepsy. Um, we've done some reviews looking at um, what papers and what research studies have been done um, in children with epilepsy. And there are um, a handful, and those that do exist suggest that um, these kinds of mental health interventions um, that work for children uh, without epilepsy are also effective in children with epilepsy. And actually our view generally in our research team is that there isn't any evidence that those same interventions shouldn't work in children with epilepsy, particularly as we know that they do work in children who have intellectual disabilities and children who have autism. And we know that actually many of the underlying causes of the mental health problems might not be related to seizures at all. And um, so this is um, a quote from the Health Talk website, which has um, lots of interviews uh, with people um, with lots of different health conditions but including children with epilepsy and this says that the relationship between epilepsy and anxiety or depression was complex for young people it wasn't just feeling down about their diagnosis but most people who had anxiety or depression said it was connected to their life situations such as problems in the family or losing a relative now you can see that actually those are difficulties that might affect any child or young person and not necessarily only those with epilepsy so again, suggesting uh, that standard evidence-based treatments that we know work in other children should work in children with epilepsy too. Um, so we did a trial of this. Um, we took uh, patients at Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, aged between 7 and 18, who had impairing symptoms of anxiety, low mood or behaviour problems. And we gave uh, them a face-to-face -face assessment. Um, with a clinical psychologist and then half of those patients um, got a telephone therapy that was based on this manual, the MATCH ADTC manual, which is a modular approach to treating um, child mental health problems but again it was developed for children without epilepsy, so for all children. Half of them got that straight away and then half of them got it after 12 weeks on a waiting list. And then uh, we used a questionnaire called the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire which um, assesses emotional and behavioural difficulties in children um, and we gave them that at the beginning of the 12 weeks and the end of the 12 weeks so that we could see which group did better um, and then uh, we also gave uh, families goal-based uh, measures which I'm going to come on to and talk in a second about every week and we interviewed all of the families who took part to find out what they thought of the uh, intervention. So the treatment itself was 10 sessions delivered over the telephone um, and we delivered that to the parents and or the young person and that was really depending um, on the presenting difficulty so um, typically uh, children with behaviour problems we would uh, treat those via um, calls with the parent and uh, those with anxiety or low mood we might be more likely to involve the young person and um, similarly if a child had an intellectual disability we'd be more likely to involve the parent and if the child was younger, we'd be more likely to involve the parent. So um, the therapy worked by us sending some worksheets with specific strategies. Again, they're the they're strategies that have been shown to work in children and who don't have epilepsy. This is uh, one one to one time, um, which is where parents uh, spend 10 minutes every day with their child um, individually in a very specific way. 
Um, and then uh, we would have calls where we would think about how those strategies could be best implemented for that specific family and that specific child. And really key to this, as I've already alluded to, is that that intervention is focused around very specific goals of the family. So these were um, goals that the family um, decided on themselves. Um, you've probably heard of SMART goals, um, but for those of you who haven't, um, that uh, stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, uh, Realistic and Time-Based Goals. And the next slide I'm going to explain a little bit more about what that means, um, thinking about specific um, young people that we might work with. I should say that these aren't real young people, so these are um, a kind of uh, collection of, of the types of uh, difficulties that we might see. So Alice is a 17 year old uh, girl who's had previous epilepsy surgery, so quite uh, severe epilepsy. Um, she presented with low mood and anxiety. And what she specifically wanted to get out of the treatment was to reduce comparison with other people. She found that she was doing that a lot and finding it very distressing. She wanted to be able to get to sleep more quickly because she was worrying a lot at night. And she wanted to worry less about what she ate um, because again, she was worrying about that in the daytime and it was stopping her from being able to enjoy other things. So we would use the depression strategies um, in the uh, therapy that I was talking about, the MATCH treatment. Um, and again, they're, they're not rocket science. So it's things like understanding what, what low mood is, uh, thinking about the relationship between um, activity and mood. Um, some problem solving, some uh, strategies around different ways of thinking and some strategies around how to calm yourself if you're feeling very stressed. And again, because Alice was 17, um, she didn't have an intellectual disability um, and the main difficulties were around um, anxiety and low mood, we delivered that intervention, would deliver that to, to Alice herself and not her parents. On the other hand, we have example two, who's Jake. So Jake is a seven-year-old. He has an intellectual disability, he's non-verbal, and he presented with behavioral difficulties. And the goals uh, for his family were for him to be able to choose food from a menu at a restaurant without becoming very distressed. And he also had some symptoms of autism uh, spectrum disorder, um, which would uh, also mean that he became distressed by changes in routine. Um, to be able to go to sleep without his parents in the room. And again, as already been talked to, um, the, the difficulties can have a uh, wide ranging impacts on the family as well. And um, so uh, the parent, th this parent, um, whenever they spent time uh, with Jake's sister, um, Jake would uh, come and interrupt that and it made it very difficult for the parent to be alone um, with his sister. So uh, for this case, we'd use uh, behavioral strategies. Um, again, these are things that you probably have heard of or might have heard of before. So things like the special time, which I've already spoken about, praise, rewards, um, and ignoring. So they're, again, the kind of strategies that would uh, work in children who don't have epilepsy. And that was delivered to the parents themselves because Jake is uh, young, he has an intellectual disability, but also because of the difficulties of behavioral. So what did we find? Well, we had 24 uh, families who completed the treatment. And there's lots of numbers on this slide, but this shows uh, here that overall, the group who were, had the therapy did better than the group um, who were on the waiting list for the therapy during the waiting list time. But actually both groups um, did pretty well, so they both improved over time. And that might be because the group in the waiting list um, control arm also got um, an assessment of their mental health needs. Thinking specifically around the goals, so um, the goals that were identified by the families themselves, so they measured those every week out of 10. So where 10 is, I've completely met that goal and that's not a problem anymore. And zero is um, I've made no progress towards that goal. We found that on average, families um, did feel that therapy was meeting their goals and, and uh, that the scores increased at each session, which suggests that the therapy was working. And then what did families themselves think of the treatment, which is obviously really important. 
So they liked that it was very practical, it was very strategy based, and because we were working towards specific goals, that it was really directed to what they were experiencing. But it was very hard work. So again, it's strategy based, and the people that are implementing those strategies are the families themselves and, and not us as a therapist, and that is difficult. But when they were able uh, to use the strategies and, and stick with it, and they found that it really impacted on their lives. And you might think that some of those goals were um, fairly small, but they had really big, um, wide ranging effects on, on families. Coming to the question, which was key for us, about whether um, we needed to adapt the therapy for children with epilepsy specifically, because again, that was a therapy that hadn't been adapted. This links to, to Faye's analogy of the iceberg. Um, but what family said, and I'm going to read this quote out, was obviously they don't need to know the ins and outs of epilepsy in the medical terms, but I think someone's got to understand that having epilepsy must be like you're walking on a frozen lake waiting for it to crack. So really what they meant was that they didn't need somebody who knew everything about epilepsy, but they really wanted to work with somebody who knew what it was like to have epilepsy and or to live with um, a family member who had epilepsy and all the difficult consequences that that can bring. So we thought this study showed that there was both a need for this kind of uh, intervention, but also that it, it worked and it was feasible to do this telephone intervention. We wonder about whether we're measuring the right thing in some of our mental health studies. So actually, um, given that the goals um, seem to make clearer um, progress, um, is that more important? Uh, and is that what families think that we should be measuring? And thinking about adaptation, again, we didn't think the therapy particularly needed adapting for um, epilepsy, but it did need to be delivered by somebody who knew um, what having epilepsy was like. So this brings us to the MY study, which is the Mental Health Interventions for Children with Epilepsy study. So this is a big NIHR funded uh, national study, um, which is a trial of a therapy based on that same intervention that I've just been talking about. Importantly, this time we're delivering it from within epilepsy services. So we're training epilepsy nurses and epilepsy staff to be able to deliver this intervention. And because we're training people who maybe are not so familiar with delivering mental health uh, treatments, um, we wanted to make some of the adaptations that um, as mental health clinicians we might have made automatically um, for the child with epilepsy. And we wanted to make some of that explicit, so we adapted um, the intervention um, with a lot of support from um, families and clinicians. So in the study we're going to have 334 families and they're going to either get this matched treatment in addition to their usual care that they would get for mental health problems at their hospital or an assessment of their mental health needs in addition to usual care for their mental health problems at their hospital. We're going to look at whether it works, so using that strengths and difficulties questionnaire and the goal-based outcomes, whether it's cost effective, so whether it, it, it's cheaper to um, treat mental health problems than not. Um, but we're also, again, going to interview families who have taken part in our intervention. And a massive thank you to you um, and all the supporters of ERUK um, for the funding that we've just received. And that's going to work to, to be used towards a project um, that's going to link the data that we collect in this MICE intervention um, to information that's already being collected in large national databases. And that, uh, those databases look at school attainment, hospital admissions, and parents' own mental health. So we can look at how the MICE treatment um, affects those different outcomes as well. This is our contact um, if anybody wants uh, further information on either the MICE study um, or the ERUK grant. And there's lots of people to thank. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sophie. I'm conscious of time and we haven't got too long for questions, but Quiva, what have you, what, what have our audience asking? Yes, we've had lots of questions. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, so one question we've had was, will improving educational attainment and epilepsy symptoms at this young age lead to long-term benefits for these people as adults? 
Um, and do you think this could impact employment opportunities and general quality of life for adults living with epilepsy? Great. That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I think in summary, yes, I would hope so. Um, so um, there's a couple of things to say. I think one is that in children, so, so we hope that um, this treatment obviously impacts on um, school attainment now um, and on mental health problems now. And there's been research that shows that treating mental health problems in childhood does have long lasting effects into adulthood. So we'd assume again that that would be the same for children with epilepsy. Um, but also, um, and one of the great things about this ERUK grant is that um, those national databases collect data um, from children right through to adulthood. So um, hopefully we'll be able to follow this group of children up into adulthood and really find that out. Brilliant. Thank you. For us? Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, so we've had another question from Jim in Swansea. Um, how would this work be impl implemented if it's a success and how do we get services to, to roll this out across the country? So that is a really good question and I think um, we've done a few things. We, we, we really thought about implementation right from the start of this study and um, so one of the things that we did was um, to record all the training for the epilepsy nurses and um, we're hoping that the epilepsy nurses that have been trained now will be able to train other nurses in the future um, so that, that's one of the biggest ways that we'd like to roll it out. Fantastic thank you I think that's all the questions we have time for. Brilliant. So, thank you so yeah much. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So, well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you. It's been great to see the level of engagement throughout and people sticking with us for the full hour. It's been terrific. I hope this kind of sets up the ways that we at Epilepsy Research UK are thinking about a life uh, more, than, more than seizures and the kind of work that we hope in future years will really enable that to happen. So I really hope you've enjoyed today. Um, there's a number of ways that you can keep in touch with us. As I said, please find us on Facebook and on Twitter. And you'll also find today we've launched our new challenge, the 6 for 600 challenge, recognising that actually 600 people a week are diagnosed with epilepsy. And what we're asking people to do is really choose their own goal in the, in the manner of Sophie and choosing uh, your own goals. But um, taking uh, a commitment to do six of what it is, six paintings, six miles, six hopscotches, six, uh, six songs uh, for the 600 and get your friends and families to uh, support you in doing that. Or if you're feeling really ambitious, we do actually have a 600 for uh, the 600. So um, whatever, whatever you feel you want to do. But um, I'll finish there as I'm very aware of time and just say thanks ever so much for joining us. And thanks to Faye, to Mike and Sophie uh, for um, for hosting this. You'll um, receive an email from us tomorrow with a, a bit of feedback and we'd love to know what you thought of today. We This is the first one we've done and we didn't know if it was going to work but uh, please let us know if you think it's been good, if you'd like us to do any more and even if there are particular topics that you're interested in. We're aware that we have not answered everything that was able to come up in the chat and questions box today but indeed we could make those uh the focus of, of future ones without me setting the team on lots more work but we'll we'll go away and have a think uh everyone enjoy the bank holiday when it comes and um thanks ever so much for joining us again